Uh, one of the remarks when I uh, came back from the uh, hike to uh, Montana was uh, uh, one of the hikers came back and felt very at ease and less stress. And I think there's, uh, if you look at the information out there from uh, nature therapy, it says that there's some kind of endorphin release that's given when you're exposed to nature. This was when I, this is one of my first hikes in Yosemite. Getting to uh, Half Dome was where I was traveling and it was a really tough hike going up from my first one. However, when I was deep into this part of the hike, it was really relaxing. You could smell the trees, you could smell the pine. Uh, it was not that cold yet and it was just quiet enough to hear the birds and nature and I definitely felt good coming back from that for about a week it lasted and uh, just like anybody else on vacation when you come back from vacation everybody's kind of always talking always showing pictures about the vacation in fact to the point of being annoying sometimes because other folks haven't been there or they want to be there too but you just can't help but bubble over and show pictures to folks or have that great feeling that's probably because of a hormone release. So, next slide. When you have a hormone release, it, uh, it usually, the question is how long does it last? So there's one hormone in particular, endorphin, endorphin and enkephalin. So for those of you who exercise, the endorphin rush, what you get after you exercise or do a 5K, you break the tape in a competition, you feel really good because there's an endorphin rush. Um, not to bore you, but the idea of an endorphin rush is if you're ever fighting uh, danger or fleeing from danger or cut, the endorphin rush is supposed to have you not feel the pain anymore, continue fleeing from danger. So there's a built-in reason for that. But the upside is that you feel good. And when you feel good, not only do you continue to perform at a higher level of intensity, uh, those of you who are in the healthcare uh, profession, you'd know that your vaccines will take better, your blood pressure will lower, your uh, sleep will be better, your palpitations will be less, your anxiety will be calmed down. That's all because of an endorphin rush. And we can do it as doctors by giving serotonin uptake inhibitors like Prozac, Zoloft, and Paxil, but why not just do it this way? So I, I guess the question would be, how do we put this into a framework? Next slide. So the idea is that if you get to places or vistas like this, this is Indiana. Um, it's called the dunes. And if you just sit there and listen to the ocean coming in, or if you just listen to one of my meditation timer videos and you can hear the ocean coming in, it's rhythmic. It kind of, if you just turn everything else off and you concentrate on the sound, it, it's rhythmic. It makes you feel relaxed because there's a certain beat in nature that occurs that helps you slow down versus the opposite when you're on a computer system especially the young people and you're watching rapid succession videos you don't even have to uh, problem solve or interpret the video you just watch the video and the action keeps on going if you've ever seen um, some of these third person uh, games that yet young people will play it's very quick the motion is quick there's a actually an instinctual part of our brain that follows without thinking it follows quick action supposed to be a built-in mechanism like if we're little kids and we haven't figured out how to problem solve and there's a fire or something rustling over here your attention will automatically go there it's a built-in instinct uh, either from protection from fire or uh, predator or if you're hunting you see something um, dash quickly you pay attention to it without even thinking so that's the speed but it's not always good to be at that speed versus this so next slide the idea, as I just mentioned, is you have a stress response that occurs. The stress response is good. When you're fighting infection, when you're um, fleeing from danger, it turns on, even if you're tired and didn't sleep all night last night, it'll still turn on your adrenal cortex, turn on adrenaline, and you'll have this surge of energy. You'll feel bulletproof, you'll attack or protect or flee. And this is Angel's Landing in uh, Utah. And uh, Angel's Landing has this bunch of, or series of chains that is kind of frightening if you are not used to, um, uh, anybody take Angel's Landing? Or, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of frightening in your first couple steps, but as you get used to it, you get less, you choke up on the chain even less, your hands become less sweaty. I, I, don't, I don't know if you felt that way when you climbed. I was okay after the first couple of steps, but I, I guess, uh, one of this gal here, she was still having issues going up to the top. 
Uh, but again, you learn to adapt, you learn to calm down. If you don't, that's a stress response I was talking about. Sometimes it's not good to have that. And definitely in a doctor's office, in an emergency room, in an immediate care center, when you go and you get that blood pressure cuff uh, put on your arm and then suddenly your blood pressure is high, that's a stress response. So if it's uncontrolled in a doc's office, that's white coat hypertension, then I challenge to say that's probably high during the day too. So you gotta be careful that you turn it on only when necessary. Next slide. The opposite of the stress response is the relaxation response. This is the Grand Canyon um, South Rim. And it's kind of cool because the Grand Canyon, when you just pull up to the Grand Canyon, you're, around, you're already on the rim. And you can just sit there, not even hike, and just get this kind of a view. But when you see this kind of a view, it usually if you don't hike, it, it still makes you feel a sense of calm. And when you feel that and you just stay there for enough time, uh, 10 to 30 minutes, you'll feel good. Even if you had problems, your taxes are due, uh, just got into an argument, or previous month you just lost a parent or lost a loved one, lost a job, when you get to this vista, it makes you feel good. And that releases parasympathetic hormone. The hormones that are usually released are the ones that make you fall in love, serotonin, oxytocin. Next slide. So the objective is to try to reproduce the serotonin oxytocin part and try to control the stress part. You'll have this sensation felt with animals. Uh, those of my uh, veterans who have come back and still suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, they're allowed to keep animals with them that give them a sense of calm. And animals definitely give a sense of calm. Although these bison are a couple thousand pounds, when you're there and you see them or you see an animal or you pet a dog in an airport, they make you feel good. Why is that? There's a reaction that humans have in the DNA that makes you want to uh, investigate and be with other species, plants, animals, uh, as long as they're not predatorial. Next slide. I think that there's great value in having a pet. If you look at the relationship between humans and animals, I think that most of us that we, you go to a zoo and it's like you just sit there in front of the elephant cage or the elephant pit and you just wonder how this huge animal is in front of you. You just stand there in awe. Not only awe, but it's also calm. Uh, even if you have a lion that's on the other side, as long as there's a protective distance, it, you just wonder in bewilderment about that thing. And that's uh, the argument for, or that's one of the theories for why we feel good on vistas, on high vistas. The theory is that in fight or flight, we run from predatorial animals like bears and wild cats and we get to a certain level, and when we get to the level, we're at peace. When we're still on the ground, we're in fight or flight. When we're up uh, at a protective level, we're in parasympathetic or peace, relaxation response. So that, that's a great segue into what I was gonna talk about. There's actually, again, I have to go back into the studies. When you're hiking, there's a stress response when you're, you're calling out the sympathetic response when you're watching the footsteps and you're planting and making sure you don't fall over. That's a sympathetic response. But the cool thing about hiking is that you balance that with looking up at your vista, and suddenly it's the parasympathetic response. So uh, the theory is that different parts of the brain will light up. So you're going sympathetic, parasympathetic. Sympathetic exercise, parasympathetic. Sympathetic, parasympathetic. There's no other activity where you're going to do that except for yoga and tai chi. So when you're concentrating on the movement, you Again, stimulate sympathetic, and then you hit the pose, and you breathe, parasympathetic. Go into the next movement, sympathetic, and then you hit the pose, and you breathe, parasympathetic. So you see the exercise of the brain. Even Tai Chi, you slowly go, and you push to the peak of the movement, and you let go and go to the next movement. So there's always this rhythmic movement that you take advantage of, and I think that's the exercise that we need that we don't take advantage of in regular exercise. Power lifters especially, I think they're always going gung-ho. My CrossFit athletes are great. They're specimens as far as muscularity and cardiovascular fitness, but I think they're also lacking in the relaxation response. I think there has to be balance between any kind of exercise, and that's why I would always say, whatever you do, this it doesn't cost anything, but adding this to the regime, I think would make it a better balanced human being. There's a 
a doctor or scientist by the name of Francis Kuo out of University of Illinois in Champaign, and Urbana, I'm sorry. And uh, she found that places in sh downtown Chicago that were uh, neighborhoods that were uh, pl uh, speckled with green, green grass, had better interactions between their neighbors, less crime, less prescriptions of uh, attention deficit disorder medicine, and better behaved kids in school versus when you had a neighborhood that had no grass, the denatured, what she called it, or somebody termed the phrase denatured, when you had no grass, there were higher crime rates, higher ADD, higher truancy. So there, it's a, it was a pretty good, well-controlled study, but it showed that when there was green, calm, when there wasn't green, aggression. So there's something that's built in, and they, even the scientists have found it. Next slide. There's uh, Esther Sternberg, before we get to what they're doing in the UK, Esther Sternberg is the, one of the directors out of the University of Arizona, uh, that's the Integrative Medicine Fellowship I took, and she studied how if you change your space, if you put a plant somewhere, if you um, clean up your house, clean up clutter, you feel better. There's definitely places. This hospital is well done because we have a uh, geothermal lake, we have green around the hospital, it makes you feel good. The campus is really nice. We're privy to that because we are not downtown in the city where uh, property is difficult to attain. So when, pe when people uh, heal, they hopefully will have a nice view and heal it faster. There is a doctor by the name of Ulrich. I, th I don't remember his first name, but he studied how fast. So the, the, what you said was when you go alone, you go faster, but when you go together, you go further. Yes. I think there's a lot of credence to that. Um, Absolutely. It's like I, I always told, I, I always wondered, not wondered, but my a one apprehension about taking a group is that if you, the larger the group, it's out. well, there is potential for one person, the speed of the group is always the slowest person. Plus the dynamics. Right. So that is always a concern, but you know, thinking about what you just said, it kind of just lets that whole issue go, right? Exactly. I, can, I think we can still go, as long as nobody gets hurt, but the likelihood of anybody getting hurt and is low. And as long as they're like-minded group. Right, yeah. I think that's uh, that's probably a good way to think about it instead of me always contemplating like, who's going to train, who's not going to train, are we going to go slow, are we going to get injured? There's probably too many things, but that's the medical part of me that always has to, if I'm going to watch over a flock, I have to make sure that all thoughts or all consequences are accounted for. But it's probably, I like your idea. If, it's, if I think of it that way, it'd probably be a lot easier to plan things. But there is benefit to what going with a group and there is benefit to sharing in a community one of the um, is there another can you click on the slide I think there's an inset yeah this is one of my patients uh, he didn't he couldn't show up today but he read Daniel Butner's book uh, Blue Zones the Blue Zones is a National Geographic book about um, five areas of the world where we had the highest concentration of 103 year olds so centenarians were highly concentrated in areas on the map that somebody had circled in blue in National Geographic. And there was a recurrent theme. They're dispersed throughout the world, but one of them, believe it or not, one of those zones is in California, Loma Linda, California, which happens to be the Seventh-day Adventists. So the, one of their concepts, and it seemed to be the recurrent theme too, mostly a whole food plant-based diet in all these places, a sense of community and belonging in all these places, uh, a day of relaxation and worship, and then uh, an activity that they're always participating in, walking or exercise. But regardless, community is still a big component of this and social positives are still a big component of the benefits. So uh, again, now I'm taking out people instead of going solo. Next slide. So. Lucky yeah. for us. Well, <laughs> uh, lucky for me too. I think that uh, your idea about going further is probably, uh, there, there's more to it than even this, the distance. I think going further in the benefits is, is probably there we can take advantage of. So for those of you who uh, are watching this, I will usually post on the Facebook on a public uh, page of, uh, about the next summit. We'll be planning in the next month on what the local summit will be. We'll be planning in the next two months on what the 2017 summit will be. So if you haven't had any 
recent to train. I watched some of my videos. Uh, I have three that are posted on YouTube about the summits, and it might inspire you to get out. If you don't, uh, if it's too much to hike or you're disabled, then just watch the videos to see if you can take advantage of nature therapy on video or on TV or on uh, YouTube. Uh, and there's no excuse, there's always ways to even buy a small flower, have some incense, or get some essential oils and pretend that you're there. But the idea is, whether you're actually on the trail or you're just in front of a nice window, a bay window, the idea is to start to dedicate yourself to a practice. So hopefully